Welcome back, everyone. It's our wetland watersheds and water wetland and watershed seminar. It is fall 2021, October 27th. Um, today, we are fortunate enough to have with us Dr. Frank muller Carger. Uh, Dr. muller Carger is a professor of biological oceanography at the College of Marine Science um, in, at USF, University of South Florida. Dr. muller Carger conducts research on how marine ecosystems change in time um, using both traditional oceanographic methods going you know, out to the sea and measuring things all throughout the water column and at the water surface, but as well as using satellite remote sensing. So sensors to study changes in water quality, production, biodiversity. And much of his work is focused on improving our ability to measure and observe phytoplankton using remote sensing. Um, beyond research, Dr. Muller Carger has a keen interest in linking science and education and particularly addressing the problem of underrepresentation under of minorities in scientific research. So he's worked hand in hand with K-12 teachers and students to showcase new technologies, highlight the importance of oceans in our daily lives and to um, improve sort of the access uh, of underrepresented minorities into science. Dr. Miller Carger has a BS, MS and PhD degrees in marine science and as well as a master's degree in management. He's co-authored over 120 scientific publications and served on the US Commission on Ocean Policy as well as the Dean of the School for Marine Science and Technology at UMass. Dartmouth. So without further ado, uh, Frank, please, you may go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yep sounds good. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit about some programs that we're organizing nationally, working with several agencies, but also internationally, and how that evolves all the time. I'll give you some of the results that we have uh, for some of the things that we're doing uh, locally in the Florida Keys, but also nationally. So I'm gonna share my screen and I hope you can see that. So if you can give me a- Looks perfect, yeah. Okay, great. So there's a, a busy screen of logos here because we are working with so many people. And it, it, it is, it's very hard to acknowledge everybody that we're working with. Uh, the work that I'm going to present to you largely is sponsored by NOAA and NASA. There, it is also a larger program that is sponsored by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the U.S. Navy. Uh, there's many, many other groups, uh, and they're all coordinated nationally through something called the National Ocean Partnership Program, which I hope you take a look at at some point, because it's a way that U.S. agencies and the administration at the federal level used to share funds. And so uh, this is a, 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 I don't wanna go on a tangent, but it's a very important program that we have uh, in the US. So one of the reasons that I wanna to talk to you about this is because they're, they're, everybody talks about this blue economy uh, and there's a lot of buzz around the blue economy, uh, especially one of the people that really pushes this concept is Rick Spinrad, who's now the head of NOAA. And so this has been, this is a concept that has been brewing for, you know, 10, 15 years already. And it is the idea that there's a lot of jobs and a lot of economic benefit that is derived directly from the ocean, but also there's a cloud of other activities that are related to that. And if you count that, it's in the order of one to two trillion dollars globally and that it's expected to grow. Now, the, the thing is that we, we cannot just expect that this growth can be sustained if we don't pay attention to how we normally exploit things in the ocean or how we use the coast. You know, there's a lot of development and in industry that unfortunately doesn't lead to a sustained uh, economy because it just drives resources into the ground. So the question is, how do we can sustain growth produce more jobs, and yet conserve the environment in a way that is beneficial to everybody today and in the future. All of these jobs and all these industries that, um, that, that you can think of in much of the blue economy has something to do with life. It, it, either it's because you're fishing directly, recreationally or commercially, or you're doing aquaculture, or you're doing navigation, or you're installing something in, in, the, in a coastal zone, some structure or, or some, some platform to drill or extract uh, some resource from the bottom of the ocean. It all has to do with life because you have an impact. And so either you have to do an impact statement 
or you have to preserve some other resource. And there's always some way it always comes back to an invasive species or your destru destruction of habitat. So the question is how how do we how do we quantify what we're doing so that we know and manage these human activities better so that we can sustain this economy. So this is the idea where a, a, a lot of people have talked about this for many, many years, but one of the newest things is this sustainable development goal or agenda 2030. And there's 17 goals. They're all really related to each other. There's no, not one that is really disconnected from the others, but people try to focus on individual ones. And so for the ocean, if you want to think about it that way, sustainable development goal 14 uh, is, it's, uh, they, they kind of shorten the name to life below water, but there's really anything that is related to the marine environment and how it links to all these other goals. So that is SDG 14. And uh, the United Nations work with a lot of people to try to see how do you highlight what's going on in the ocean and, and develop a good framework for the, for the economy and, and sustaining jobs. And so the, in, in the, it, leading up to 2017, they, they had a process to design this uh, ocean decade or the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And so everybody shortens it to the ocean decade, which is more about sustainable development than about science. But how do you link those two things? And so this, this is part of what I'm gonna talk to you about today is this ocean decade and how you can get involved. The ocean decade, uh, basically is, a, is driven by these challenges that you have on the right hand. Uh, there's, you know, there's 10 challenges. Uh, we, my group is very involved in challenges two, nine and 10, which is basically uh, looking at how ecosystems work and how do you use information about biodiversity? How do you develop the knowledge skills to not only collect data, but use the data in a wise way and then kind of have a, a, a public relations effort to try to bring the public more in tune or kind of broadening the audiences that we have to talk about the ocean. But if you look at it from the left-hand side, the ocean we have, you know, the, the, the motto of the ocean decade is the ocean, uh, the, the, the science to get to the ocean we want from the ocean we have. So you, you have, the decade ha has these objectives uh, that is all about knowledge in the blue economy is intended to be a concept of in, uh, of how do you use information to to drive the economy so you you can identify the knowledge generate the knowledge and then use the knowledge and those are the objectives of the decade and the way they do this is by trying to stand up what they call decade actions the actions there's a whole bunch of them uh, the the highest level it is what they call programs, which are kind of a framework that it can be global in scale, long-term, and where you can fit a number of different projects under. And then you have, each project can have activities. Activities would be uh, more, more focused in a region or a series of webinars or, or uh, relatively, so it doesn't have to be global in scope. And contributions are effectively how you, how you contribute in a, um, in a monetary way or in, in a way that you can do an in-kind contribution with people. So that way, these, and these actions are in process now. They went through an announcement last year. They selected some programs and projects earlier this year and they announced them in June. And they now have an, a new call that just came out about a week or two ago. And I'll talk about that again. So when, when the decade, uh, selects a program or a project, they, they, they call it an endorsement. And the group that does that is called a, the Decade Coordinating Unit. And that, is, that lives inside of something called the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission or IOC. The IOC is, a, is a, uh, basically a program under, the, on, under UNESCO. One, so it's the part of the United Nations. So what they did is they selected over 30 programs and many of them are things that you may already know. They, there's one that's called Marine Life 2030, which we lead. And uh, 
we want to invite you to that. But there are others in which we're involved in or not involved in, but we want to try to coordinate with uh, one, for example, on best practices. There's one on biomolecular. How do you stand up on a biomolecular observing network in the ocean? There's something called Challenger 150, which goes back to the Challenger expedition and it deals with the deep ocean. There's also some that I think you need to be aware of that are trying to, uh, the, the decade is a very inclusive uh, environment. They're trying to do things in terms of uh, justice and equity and diversity. And so there's a, a, a program on empowering women and there's one on early career ocean professionals. So I encourage you to look those up and get engaged. The new call for actions released just a few days ago is you can find it in, in this oceandecade.org website. And you can uh, uh, now submit proposals to join some of the existing programs, establish new programs or uh, do something else like contribute some type of resource. So we're inviting people through this process to contribute projects specifically to Marine Life 2030 and to join with other groups like uh, the Biomolecular Ocean Observing Network or the best practices, which we're trying to link together uh, quite actively. So just kind of a, a time history of where we are today is if we go back to to the early 1990s. And so you see that there's not a lot of time has gone by and a lot of things have happened, and yet there's a lot of things that still need to happen. Way back in the early 1990s, people are, were trying to organize the ocean observing community similar to what the weather community did 50, 60 years ago. So today you can, you can find a lot of shared weather data, temperature, precipitation, uh, you know, you name it. These are things that you need to forecast weather effectively around the world. And so the ocean community organized itself in some, into something called the Global Ocean Observing System that was sort of formalized uh, and attached to the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission way back in 1991. And there were many things that were related to that that came out of that uh, under the IOC. The IOC is a political body under UNESCO, so it, uh, it, it, it has representations from member countries, and typically these are countries that are uh, coastal nations. Then in, in the 2000s uh, timeframe, uh, a group decided that, you know, goose is very important, but it, it, it historically has been focused very much on physics and, and almost exclusively physics, physics and, and uh, slowly had been growing a biogeochemical effort because of the ocean acidification push. But it, even though they, there was a sense that we needed to measure biology, that wasn't really part of the, uh, of, of the formal operational activities that were being stand, stood up under GOOSE. Uh, and if you think about GOOSE, and the, the US is a participant in GOOSE under something called the Integrated Ocean Observing System or IUS, that's the US contribution to GOOSE and many different countries have their own uh, regional, what they call a, a, a regional alliance uh, around the world. So people recognizing that the, the one thing that we, we were all trying to do, we measure temperature, we measure weather, we measure all these physical things and the pH and chemistry of the ocean, because we think that it's gonna have an impact on life. Yet the last thing we were measuring is life. You know, so this, this is the, in part because the technology drives what you can observe, there is this gap in how much or when or how much information we have about the life in the sea, especially uh, what lives, where, uh, how much is there, what's the productivity. So these basic fundamental biological observations are even still today not being collected properly. And the, and the, the, the end result is that we cannot forecast life the way that we can forecast weather or that we can forecast ocean currents. And so we, we want to go in that direction and be able to forecast life because we depend on, on uh, our, our own life depends on how we manage this planet. So uh, in the 2000s, we stood up the census of marine life that was a privately funded, you know, $650 million by the Sloan Foundation. 
and it it brought a, a tremendous attention internationally on how, on detecting species where they live. It's kind of more of a presence absence uh, effort, just because we didn't have enough information even about what was living where, and and that ended in 2010. A lot of people were sort of left out. Uh, you know, the program ended and nobody wanted to support it or to support a follow-on. And yet other agencies, especially NOAA, NASA, NSF participated as well, BOEM, Navy, decided in the U.S. that, well, we need to stand something up. And so they, they had a series of workshops and stood up something called the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. That was happening at the same time that GOOSE, the Global Ocean Observing System, decided to form a biology and ecosystems panel that is called Goose BioEco, the same time, 2014. And internationally, the, the group on Earth observations uh, called GEO, that's a kind of a parallel structure to the United Nations, uh, decided to also stand up a, a biodiversity observation network called GEOBON. So under GEOBON, uh, we, we proposed to have an MBON that was already being formalized in the U.S. through funding. And uh, so that's where we are today. We have a, an MBON that is active. It's funded. There's a call for proposals out in the street right now with proposals due in December in the U.S. And there's an international framework. So a lot of the effort is to try to convince people that we need to use standards for measuring biological properties of the world and in using standards for data formatting and sharing the data, which has historically been a problem for biologists. So now in 2021, we, we noticed that a lot of people thought, saw MBON as, a, as, a, as its own thing, you know, and we said, wait, we don't wanna, uh, we don't wanna be under MBON, which was never the idea. MBON is a networking mechanism and not an umbrella to take over things or to relabel things. So we found that there's a lot of resistance between people and we thought, well, we need to find a way to network groups. And we decided to work with the Ocean Decade and proposed Marine Life 2030. So Marine Life 2030 is another effort to try to bring people together. There's a lot of partners, including the Ocean Biodiversity Information System and, and uh, UNEP, the World Conservation and Monitoring Center and many others. No? And we know why we need to do this because the world is changing. We know the world is warming up. Uh, we don't even know how many species there are. We know that there's, we have looked at, counted and described about 200,000 species, but we think that there's over a million species in the ocean, mainly bacteria and microorganisms. And, and yet we don't, we don't know them. We haven't, we have not been able to describe them. So uh, the, the ocean economy is important. We, a lot of people depend on the ocean for food and, and jobs. So what MBON and Marine Life 2030 are trying to do is organize these different international groups into something that makes sense and have people talk to each other about organizing uh, the observations of life in the sea. So on, I described one process on the left-hand side here that is under UNESCO. That, which is really broader because it brings in a lot of other UN groups. And we have this group on the right-hand side, which is disconnected from the UNESCO and UN side, but it's also, it, it involves over a hundred countries and it's called the GEO. So uh, we're, we have a lot, of, a, a lot of my time is spent in meetings, trying to get these two groups together. Uh, and it, I, I don't know if, if, if you want to get involved, but I welcome you because this is a mammoth job and it needs a lot of people talking to each other to generate the data that we need in order to be able to forecast living resources. The way that we do that is we have this framework for ocean observing that is part of what Goose developed uh, already 10 years ago. And it, it's, uh, it's kind of on the left-hand side. So Goose, the Global Ocean Observing System works to uh, uh, to set requirements. What do nations need? What do international agreements need? What do individual groups that in any county or city need about the ocean, be it physical variables or chemical variables or biological variables? So these 
these uh, these variables, which they decided to call essential ocean variables, are are kind of coded in a series of spreadsheets where they, you you define the specifications of what it is that needs to be measured, the kinds of things that need to be measured. In NBON, what we do is we try to network the community to uh, around certain standards uh, uh, of how you measure things and then how you walk data into uh, into open data platforms like OBIS. And so the the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, there's another, another one that we use called GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. These are open databases where people are, that are willing to share the data deposit them in very structured formats. And these formats are quite comprehensive. They go way beyond just documenting whether a species exists or doesn't exist in a location. You can quantify time, place, uh, abundance, productivity, and also some of the environmental variables or have a link to another database in the OBIS uh, records. These OBIS records, are called, they're formatted using something called Darwin Core, the Darwin Core standard. And so it's, it's useful if, you, if you're a biologist that you understand that the one way that we can make machines talk to each other, everybody talks about artificial intelligence and how machine learning, but if machines cannot learn about a data set, then we're toast. So one thing that we need are standards on how you walk the data around. And that's what uh, we're trying to work with, with these different groups. So the, the, the ultimate intent is to generate products like indicators or indices that people can use about the status of a resource and track it over time. Ideally you have these indicators in the form of maps where you can have stacked maps of physical, chemical, and biological or biodiversity properties. The idea of essential variables came from the climate community. The, the, you may have heard about essential climate variables. And so this was established probably about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, and everybody thought that was a good idea. And now all of these variables are trying to, people are trying to get them together because they, they really hang with each other. So essential climate variables are things like air temperature, ocean temperature, precipitation, things that you use to track the status of climate or the state of climate. The global ocean observing system deals with the essential ocean variables or EOVs. And there are these different panels the, uh, there's a physical panel, a chemical panel, and a biological panel. And they, they work with each other because nobody pretends that you're going to just measure zooplankton and that's it. You have to measure some physical quantity or biogeochemical if we want to understand the world. Now, another group that de decided to establish essential variables is this GeoBond, the Group on Earth Observations. And they came up with the idea of essential biodiversity variables. And so there's a, there's a lot of buzz, but there's also a lot of confusion around about what these things mean. And the essential biodiversity variables is nothing but maps or stacked maps, basically data cubes of essential ocean variables for us in the, in the ocean community. So if you think about it, uh, if you can make maps of genetic composition or species distribution or species traits and have time series of them, then you have an essential ocean, uh, essential biodiversity variable, or EBV. And that's what we need to derive these indicators. This is what we talk about when we, uh, when we talk about essential ocean variables for biology and ecosystems. And it's these, these it's, I'm not telling you that these things are different. I mean, they, we're just trying to organize the community to talk the same language around standards, and sta especially if we're gonna measure these things in an operational way. So that if somebody in a, in a country X decides to stand up an observing system, they can go to a cookbook scenario and say, for this problem, you can measure these different essential ocean variables and you may have uh, an indicator about the conditions of your of your resources. Another thing that we're doing is we're trying to understand what technology is available today and push for the uh, updating or development of that technology. And so we're we're looking at these different EOVs, uh, 
and and seeing what technologies are is it optics is it satellite data is it animal tracking through acoustics or satellite tax and a very very active field of course is omics and we're pushing for the concept of environmental dna or edna which uh, allows us to do a, a lot of things very very quickly but it's still quite expensive and doing this with automated samplers Ultimately, all of this has to come together in databases, and so we're pushing for visualization and in, uh, in, in, in data science concepts. So all of these databases have to be linked together. We, we know that there's an enormous and easy access to satellite data, but even all the satellite data are different. The temperature satellite data is different from the sea ice data, from the wind data and precipitation data, and so it's a mess for people that are trying to use these if you don't know anything about managing large quantities of data or if you're a resource manager that wants to use some of the, these uh, data sets to understand what's happening. A lot of other data, field data, goes into what we call these databases. And there's some like the NCEI that is managed by NOAA or Data One. Uh, it, but there's a lot of different databases out there. And, most of them are not connected to each other. So it's a mess. Uh, you have genetic data going to, to the nucleotide databases like GenBank here in the US, but there's others around the world. And while those are linked with each other, the, the nucleotide databases, they're not linked to, to biological databases like OBIS or GBIF or the uh, NCEI. So that's one thing that we're trying to do. Ultimately, you wanna link this to socioeconomic data, which is always the last frontier, and it should be the first thing to consider when we're doing these. So what we're trying to do is the, 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 the framework for establishing databases that host data sets in standardized fashion that include taxa with tags for space and time so that you can make maps, track abundance, and, and, and look at trends over time. We have... Uh, all of this seems so um, intuitive, but it isn't. It, we're trying to organize it in, in, through this diagram in the bottom, which was just published uh, just a few weeks ago, where we have the occurrence of organisms stored in databases using the Darwin core format, which is kind of a parallel to the CDF or, or net CDF data structure for climate data, even though you can store Darwin core structures in NetCDF file formats, and we store them in data servers and serve them through the same ser services like ERDAP that you use to serve climate data or weather data. And then use the, the viewers that we have on the right-hand side of the diagram. In many cases, we're trying to cook up very, very simple infographics that, and I'll show you an example of that later on. So the MBON projects right now uh, around the US cover not everywhere, but they, we have some healthy coverage on the west coast of the US from uh, California to Oregon, all the way to Alaska. The Alaska group is looking at the Chukchi Sea. And on the east coast, we have a group looking at the Gulf of Maine and we have our group looking at the Florida Keys. We also have a group looking at what we call the pole to pole MBON, which is trying to work with especially groups in Latin America uh, and working on, on standard observing methods for sandy beaches, rocky shores, and uh, satellite data, all of that to put data into the open data sources. And we do that working with the groups that I've mentioned, so I'm not going to spend time on this. So some examples, the Embot pole to pole to the Americas has a, a, a graphical interface. If you look it up, you, you'll find this type of a, a device where you people in different places can easily, they can click on their station and they can get a download of the satellite data, the historical data from OBIS, and they can input their data as well to see how it looks in context of, uh, of other data sets. In Florida, we have uh, our MBON South Florida program, which we, we, we go out on a ship every two months. We work, do this jointly with NOAA, AOML, and the, the state of Florida with the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. Uh, 
There are several other groups involved. Our cruisers go out of Miami, go out on the Keys, and then they come up uh, the west coast of Florida. <clears throat> Basically, this, this past year, we started going up to Tampa Bay because there were red tides that were recurrent, and we wanted to make sure that we covered those as well. So they were working with the state of Florida and the red tide group there as well. So this data is all available. We put our data as quickly as we can, at least our data, not, and not everybody on the cruises shares their data, unfortunately, but our group shares all of the data, uh, everything from pigments to, uh, to the uh, DIC data, to nutrient data, to the optics data that we collect, and we put it in open databases as quickly as we can. Uh, an example that we did with the MBON project in Florida is try to look at the, the reef fish uh, variability in terms of species, abundance, and so on. And so these are some of the results we just published is that we find that unfortunately over time, the protection that no take areas afforded to, to fish in the Florida Keys has sort of decreased or the amount of fish in non-protected areas is very similar now to what it is in protected areas. And so why exactly this is, is not completely clear. But it turns out also that larger protected areas in the Florida Keys are just as effective as small ones. And we think that the problem is that one is, is that even what we call large protected areas, like the Eastern Sambo Reserve is, is still too small because so the reserves are not big enough to protect the, the diversity of these fish. And as you, most of you know, even though coral reef diversity and cover has stabilized over the past few years, there was a, it's nothing compared to what it was in the 1970s. So there is a big issue on, on looking at biodiversity and, and the resources in these areas. We're also using satellites, uh, whatever satellite you can think of, we are using it to look at uh, how do we classify biogeography in the sea? And not just as a static map like we used to have in atlases before, but how does this change historically? Can we track trends in biogeography in the seas? And we developed this uh, that we call seascapes with uh, Maria Cavanaugh in, at Oregon State University. So th those are now operational. They're, they're served operationally through NOAA Coast Watch. An example of that is in using our Enbron cruises is we're comparing, comparing these seascapes with what we collect on board the ship. So we're trying to see if these seascapes make sense. And so one of the ways is comparing it to phytoplankton groups. And so we, we find that there is some correlation, smaller phytoplankton being farther offshore and bigger phytoplankton living near shore. And people in California are doing that with fish. Uh, some, some other groups are trying to do that with marine mammals. So there's a big effort with many people trying to compare acoustics, uh, fish concentrations or abundance in phytoplankton or other types of plankton and how that tracks over time with seascapes. We're trying to do that with eDNA also and even comparing eDNA assessments with acoustics in the Florida Keys. Now we have a a time series of eDNA measurements in the, in the Florida Keys. This is an example that Annie Juras did uh, where she compared the traditional ways of counting zooplankton using, um, for example, microscopy and uh, uh, from in, in eDNA. And we find that it's not always the same, but the eDNA gives you a, a lot more information that you would normally collect with other methods. You can even find ways of, we did this comparison between the Monterey Bay in Florida and the Florida Keys. There are two sanctuaries. We work closely with national marine sanctuaries where you can look at associations between groups of species using uh, eDNA data. And, and we try to put all of this together in a way that is accessible to, to sanctuary managers. We found that if we present these com complicated data sets to a manager and say, hey, why don't you go use this? They, they really, they don't have time. They're, they're trying to work uh, sanctuary permitting and other uh, programs that they have. And they just don't have time to, to do a data analysis that is as deep as a, as a scientist could or a, as a student or a PhD 
uh, or a postdoc could. So we need to present the data to the public in a way that is much more accessible. And one way that we found to do that is through these infographics where we have cartoons of the environment. And uh, for example, you can have a coral reef or a seagrass or a kelp forest uh, annotation and some organism that they may be interested in. And if they click on it online, that links to the data and it's a data set that gets updated regularly. And so they can look at, uh, at it year after year or every time that a data set is updated, they would get that. And that's linked to the satellite data record, like temperature, chlorophyll, seascapes, and they can get these, uh, a, a, a series of time series in a way that is relatively understandable. We're also doing these dashboards in the Gulf of Mexico. We're doing that for the flower garden banks because we, there was an event that they detected mortality in the coral reefs due to, uh, uh, as far as we can detect, uh, a, an event where a lot of fresh water from the coast moved over to the flower garden banks, which is over hundred miles offshore. But that was enough fresh water to cause such a stable environment and a turbidity plume that caused anoxia on the reef uh, uh, and a lot of corals died. So it, there, it hasn't happened since, but they asked us to do a tool where you can get a kind of an alert based on automated satellite data sampling that tells you, hey, you have a, a turbid water plume coming your way. And so that, that's online now. And we have something similar for red tides as they wash down toward the Florida Keys. And this is kind of what it looks like. You can, you get the satellite data, you can look at time series and you look at time series of other parameters like um, the chlorophyll concentration or also river discharge or turbidity that we may have uh, access to. So the, a lot of these results are coming online now in a, in a, a special issue of oceanography on MBON, it's just being put together now. Some of the articles are online now and leading up to what we're trying to promote as a marine life effort. And so marine life is, a, is the proposal that we have for the ocean decade for which we're inviting now projects. Uh, it, it is, at least in the US, there's a lot of good will, good buzz about uh, the ocean decade, but there has not been any funding that the U.S. has put, put behind the, uh, the Ocean Decade programs. And so that's something that we're trying to work. It, it, if you're interested in, in help, helping with that, it is time to work with your con congressional delegation, for example, and say, hey, you know, we have, the, we have the Ocean Decade, the U.S. should participate, and you, you should put money into these programs. And as the budget process that we're going through right now in the US is extremely complicated. Uh, there's still time and, there, and, and there's always uh, an opportunity to talk to your representatives to make sure that these kinds of things happen. So with marine life, we want to bring people together to talk about requirements, priorities, uh, developing standards, but especially doing this in a way that is useful to people that use uh, data, you know, the, the park managers, marine protected area managers, people that are looking at red tides in an operational sense, people in industry that are doing fisheries or aquaculture or, or, or environmental impact statements. We want to integrate biology into an observing system, a global ocean observing system, so that we're not only depending on physical data to predict what biology is going to do without having the biology to verify that or to calibrate the models, which is what we do now. We do biology by proxy. And so we want to establish this idea that we want to co-develop the uh, Marine Life 2030. And these are some of the things that we want to do that we call activities, basically having workshops, uh, training efforts, uh, continue to work on standardizing methods and getting the community involved in that entire process. So anyway, if you want to get involved or if you are interested in these kinds of things, please send me a note. Um, I'm easily accessible uh, at this email. Thank you.
Great, thanks so much, Frank. Let's give uh, Dr. Mullikarger a round of real or virtual applause, your choice here. Um, and we will take questions from, um, from the group here, as well as I'll go check on YouTube. Christine, I see you have a question in the chat, if, you will, if you're available, otherwise I can ask on your behalf. Oh, sure, you yeah, go. hi, Frank. Sorry, I'm going to, I'm in charge of kid pickup today, so I apologize if my um, internet is a little spotty. So um, my question is about um, the idea of like potentially publicly sharing information about some like key targeted species, whether that's um, uh, organisms that could be exploited uh, like key fisheries and um, or endangered species where if the whereabouts of these organisms becomes more publicly known, it creates an opportunity for um, exploitation and whether that's kind of ecotourism and, you know, going and looking after whales where we know that they are. And so I'm just wondering about sort of the sensitivity of, of making publicly available some of the data that's coming about from, um, from these biological observations and coordinated networks and, and how the community is thinking about what, if and how and in what ways to share this information with the general public. Yeah, well, that's a very, very important question. There, there are several ways that I think that you can handle that. One is working with industry, of course, and making sure they understand that uh, knowledge doesn't mean just go take out everything you can. One other way is to uh, synthesize the information. So we're interested in tracking the health of, of, of the environment of the ocean or the health of a population. You don't have to make explicit where you have a specific uh, organism living at one time or where they reproduce like spawning aggregations. Most fishermen know this anyway. So I don't think that you're gonna be telling fishermen something they don't know in many cases, but what we can help is in track the health of a population. So typically what people do is they share the data with a data aggregator that doesn't share the original data, but pr produces a product that is um, constructed with a method that is verifiable if you had access to the original data. So there's, uh, I think that there are ways to do this, Christine, without necessarily encouraging people to exploit the resource further, but it is an important question. Thanks. And I, I, um, I, seeing the global scope of the sort of the goals for the ocean decade for MBON, it's, it's like in, at one hand overwhelming, you know, just to think about the great biological diversity that you're trying to catalog and coordinate. And of course, it's, uh, that's also motivating, right? Because if you don't catalog and coordinate it now, we may be losing it before we even understand it. Um, <clears throat> I guess, I guess my question goes to like that giant set of data that you that you and colleagues and all over the hundreds and perhaps thousands of investigators and agencies are compiling, being so difficult for uh, um, a natural resources manager to ask questions with. And so there's this intermediary step that you said, of course, so, you know, with a PhD student or a postdoc or a PI, you know, that's our, that's like, that's what we love to do. But it also means funding way beyond the crews way beyond the satellite, you know, operationalizing monitoring costs so much money. And then often it just stops and you have to, you have to really scrabble for the change, the loose change to do anything useful with it. I guess, can you offer us any kind of guidance for, or, or are you, is the team working to like, we, yeah, we need to do 75% money on monitoring or whatever it is, but we need a chunk, a big chunk to do something useful with these data beyond scrapping for grant money after the fact. Well, that's our life, isn't it, David? <laughs> so, it seems uh, like it, but there's got to be a line here to be, you know, we've got to tap the vein somehow so we can get inference that's useful out of these data. Otherwise, it's a wonderful, amazing coordinated database of data, and that's it. Well, I, I, I totally agree with you. There, and there's no one answer to this. I, I think that you do work with a, a user to try to show the need. If, if the user is one off and one single person, it's not as important for a government entity or industry to fund the continuing collection and organization of the data. So we work with several groups in the US. The Integrated Ocean Observing System is a critical group to, to, that serves as that boundary organization. 
So in the in the Gulf of Mexico, we work with something called GCUS, the Gulf of Mexico Coastal Ocean Observing System. And then on the Atlantic side, we work with Secura, the Southeast Coastal Ocean uh, Regional Association. In the Caribbean, we work with CARICUS, the Caribbean Coastal Ocean Observing System. And so in the US, you have these regional associations of IUs that, that a, a big part of their job is to connect the, the user with a scientist and vice versa. <clears throat> They're running into the same problem. Their budget is limited. They're always short. They cannot sponsor everything that they want. So we are trying to, uh, uh, you know, in, in a way that the, the decade, the UN decade is a, is a mechanism to highlight this, this need of connecting users to observers uh, through science, no? So it, it's, it's not, uh, I don't want to minimize the importance of a, a mechanism like the decade to advertise the, this requirement for funding, but that's what it is. You know, it, it, nothing works without funding. And so you have to uh, organize the science community better to be relevant to people, not just to ourselves, because I mean, I cannot tell you how many papers I've written that maybe my students read them because I tell them to read it, but that's about it, you know? And it, so what's the point of that? And so if, if the information that we're producing is not useful to more people, then uh, I, I think we're wasting a lot of taxpayer money in our own times. And so I think that this is part of the effort is, is trying to, yeah, we should do uh, curiosity-driven science, because there's many things that we discover that wouldn't come any other way and that have an application. Uh, if we didn't look for an El Nino, we would have never done that. And that was discovered through science. Right. You know, there's things like that. Okay, there's untold examples. So you do have to have a hypothesis-driven science, but it also you need to do that in a way that is conscious that somebody has to, in the end, use some of the things that you're doing. And ideally you should be aware of societal needs and, and be in tune. If you ask a manager, what do you need? Often, well, I don't know. I mean, what do you have? And you, you ask each other the same question until you start talking with each other and maybe there's a dialogue mm -hmm. that can lead someplace. Well, I think your examples of the portals like the early warning systems that you've set up, they were motivated by need. They're, um, <clears throat> their potential to be realized came not only from the data, but as as you know, you know the uh, remote sensing algorithm of X or Y, it works or it doesn't work. It improves when you work with the stakeholder who says, no, it's not working for this purpose. Right. And then, um, so it may be targeted to a, um, a small set of users, but those are the people on the ground trying to make sense of, of their observations, sort right. of, and you're adding to that. Um, any other, so we've, um, heading up, we got about one more minute and, and Calvin, a question or Liz, a question. Hi Frank, um, it's really nice to see you again here. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just, thank you for talking. I'm just really interested in, like uh, you mentioned, how does this kind of different scales of um, data just kind of uh, could be incorporated or linked and you guys are kind of working on that. So I'm just wondering like uh, what kind of ways that um, is there available or, you know, what kind of uh, methodology is there to actually linking, for example, you, you mentioned genetic, biodiversity and social economic data. These are really like um, wide data sets to be linked. So I'm just wondering how is that could be done? Yeah, what's the general approach? Yeah, with, with omics data, there's, uh, it's actually a very active field of research. There's two ways that people use eDNA data right now. One is you can use primers or markers for genes that you know is something that you want to detect if you want to de detect a specific species like an invasive species. And so this is actually operational. Many groups use it, many agencies use it. It is very well established science. What is not so established is the discovery of what's there just by looking at everything. You know, you, you can use several different primers, you collect a, a glass of water and you try to see what's there. And that, and there's a lot of questions about, you know, how long that eDNA is viable for. Uh, did you get a big chunk of a whale in your sample and that contaminates and overwhelms everything? Or 
what do you do with all these taxa that you don't find in any database and they just don't look like anything? And so you have all these, you know, half of your sample could be dark taxa. So a lot of people are, are now involved in trying to understand what is it that you can do with this enormous explosion in omics methods and data. Another problem is that every lab you go to does things differently. So the eDNA data or the omics data that you collect in one group may do at your university is different from what I collect. And so it's, they're not comparable. So how do we get to the point where people are collecting data and processing it in a, in a way that is more or less standardized as you're going through a technological revolution? And we're not, we're not there yet. So I, I don't think that we have an answer on exactly how do you combine, for example, the omics data with everything else. We know how to com combine, for example, uh, abundance of organisms or productivity with temperature and even have some very primitive models that say, well, if, you, if your temperature goes up, the physiology or the productivity of something may go up until a point and then things don't go up anymore. But that it, in order to get there, you have to have the data. If you don't have the data, you cannot do the models, even the conceptual models and test them to, to derive. So uh, uh, the question you ask is, at the core of all of the science that we do. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, and I know Kevin's considering scaling up field data to remote sensing, even for one organism or maybe three or four organisms. So it becomes much more challenging across the diversity of life. Well, thanks again, Dr. Muller Cogger, for sharing with us this uh, ambitious and sort and just ambitious in scope and scale vision. And uh, we look forward to hearing more about it and wor working with you in the future. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thanks so folks. We'll see you all me. next week. Everyone be good, be well, um, and uh, be good to everyone. Be good to yourself. Cheers. Thank you.